In this question, we're going to tackle the wild snakes known as trig functions. Okay, this looks ugly to my brain. Let's color code it. Yeah, it's much better. All right, now we've got to get the values of A and P. A is over there and P is over there. So let's start off by getting A with the cos graph. And your A value is responsible for two things. It can reflect over the X axis and it can vertically stretch or compress the graph. So we're gonna start here. Do I see a reflection over the x-axis? To tell whether or not it has been reflected, I need to know what my normal graph looks like, the y equals cos x. So you can see with y equals cos x, this hump should go on top of the x-axis, but now that hump is going under the x-axis. So it has been reflected, so my a value is gonna be negative. If there was no reflection, my A value would be positive. Okay, now we're gonna have a look at the vertical stretch and compression. And when I have a look at my normal cos graph, it goes from negative one to one, so it spans up two units. But this current cos graph I have goes from negative two to two, so that spans up four units. So I've got to ask myself, what did I multiply two by to get four? And the answer is two, I multiplied by two. So A will be negative two. And now that we have A, it's time to get P. So we're gonna jizz in Yonke the sine graph. Okay, let's have a look at the sine graph and what P is responsible for. So if your variable is being added or subtracted inside the bracket, then it's responsible for moving the graph left and right. And with our normal sine, sine graph of Y equals sine of X, we use this as a focal point. It should start at zero and zero, but now this graph starts at 30. So what's happened is it's moved 30 to the right. So we've got to compensate accordingly with P. So P will definitely be 30, and because it's moving right, there's got to be a negative in front of that 30. But since there is a negative already over there, P is just a plain old positive 30. And then we're just gonna get one marker pop for our answers over there. But they're not actually asking us to get the values of A and P. They're saying get the equations of your graphs so you can start working with them in future questions. Next up, we need to find the range of F and F is our blue graph. So we're gonna set up our notation to look like this because range is y values. You're going to tell me about the smallest y value that the graph exists at and the biggest y value that the graph exists at. And we are going to use square brackets because it does include those points. There's no asymptotes in these graphs. So we're going to go to our graph and we look for the biggest and smallest y value. And your smallest y value will be over here at negative 2. And the biggest y value that the graph ever reaches will be over there at positive two. So we always put the lower one on the left and the higher one on the right. And that's it, that's your range. Bear in mind another notation is possible. You are also allowed to state it like this. Y is in between two and negative two and it follows quite a similar structure of the smallest one goes on the left, lower on the left and the biggest one goes on the right. And that's telling me the graph exists everywhere in between negative two and two. And we get one mark for notation over here. So do you have like the right brackets and that Y is an element of? And then the second mark comes from the interval. Do you have the right numbers stated over there? In 3.3, we've been given a completely new function H of X, which has introduced a B in front of X. And they tell us that the period of H is 60 degrees, and with that we need to write down the value of B. Yes, this is some other hieroglyphics, bro. No, I'm just joking. We have a formula to cope with this. And that formula goes like this. So, the coefficient of X, or the number in front of X, goes in front here. And then that's equal to 360 degrees divided by the new period of the graph. So, the new period is 60, so I'm going to change that to 60. And 360 divided by 60 will just give you 6. 
Just slap that in your calculator, press equals just to triple check yourself there, but and your one mark just comes from the answer of 6. Now we have to determine the values of x if f of x is smaller than g of x. So f of x is the blue graph, g of x is the green graph. Now do you see how the crocodile is eating g of x? It's kind of giving you instructions that they want g of x on top and they want f of x at the bottom. So I can see that happening from here to here. So it's going to start at negative 60, and then that's going to come to an end at 120. You can see after I cross 120, the green graph is at the bottom and the blue graph is at the top. Also, once I cross that negative 60 towards the left, the blue graph is on top and the green graph is at the bottom. So it doesn't satisfy this inequality. Only this region in between does. <coughs> so how we're going to state this is we're going to do x is an element of, and then we're going to use round brackets because there's no equals to sign here with the inequality. So it does not include my starting and ending point. And then inside those brackets, we're going to put from negative 60 to 120. And just remember, you always want the lower one on the left. And there is another notation that's perfectly acceptable here. It's where you put x in the middle of the two inequalities. And also, same principle, lower on the left. And much like previous questions, one mark for the interval and one mark for the notation. And welcome to your challenge round. We've got to determine the values of x where x times f of x is greater than 0. So f of x is our blue graph, so we're only working with the blue graph. So I'm going to get rid of the green graph. And now we are going to break down the statement over here. So firstly, you see that x over there? That represents a stock standard x value. And then this dot over here means that I'm multiplying. And then f of x is a fancy way of saying the y value. And then this greater than zero is a fancy way of saying positive. So we're looking for an x value times a y value that will give us a positive. And our focal points here are three points. The x intercepts as well as the y intercepts. So let's get those marked off quite clearly. And then we analyze each little portion of the graph. So I analyze this portion, this portion, this portion, and then lastly, this portion. So let's start all the way on the left over here. If I go down, I've got a negative x value. And if I go across, I've got a positive y value. And that will give me a negative times a positive, which does not give me a positive. So it won't work in this interval over here. So after we cross 90, maybe then it will work. So after I cross 90, I'm going to have a negative x value as well as a negative y value. So I'm getting a negative times a negative, which will give me a positive. So it is working over there. Okay, now how are we going to state that? Is we say x is an element from negative 90 to 0 because it starts there and it ends over there. As soon as I cross this line, the y-axis, then I'm going to have a positive x value, which I'll go through next. So after we cross the x value of 0, then I'm going to get a positive x value. You can see the positive like 30 there or positive 60. But I'm going to get negative y values. And a positive times a negative will not give me a positive. So it doesn't work from 0 to 90. But maybe after I cross 90, it will work. All right, and after I cross 90, yes, yes, I'm getting a positive times a positive. So it will give me a positive and it's working. So next to this bracket, I just clap the word or, and then I state the next interval. It starts at 90 and it ends at 180. And then I'm officially done with this question. It's waxed, my bro. Let's have a look where the two marks come from. Okay, you just get one mark for each interval over here. And bear in mind, you will lose marks if your, if your notation is not correct. That other notation from earlier is also acceptable. 
And the last question for these wild slungs gives us a new graph k of x with the following equation. And we need to get the value of that t there if k of x is equal to g of 2x. So we don't need the graphs for this question. We solely work with this equation, this equation, and we need g's equation. So I'm going to get rid of the graphs and just grab g's equation. Okay, so after I grab g's equation, this line over here is giving me instructions. k of x is equal to g of x, but we're going to have to replace this x over here with a 2x. So, we basically rewrite this equation, but instead of this x, we replace it with a 2x. And now that I have the equation of k of x, I kind of want it to get to match this. I want cos, I don't want sine. So how we convert from a sine to a cos is by using our co-functions. So I'm going to use the following co-function, cos of 90 minus theta equals sine of theta. So this is going to change to a cos, and then it's going to be 90 minus this angle in the brackets, just like this. And that will successfully convert the sine into a cos. Now what I'm going to do is distribute this negative into the circular brackets. And after I do that, I get minus 2x and plus 30. And then 90 plus 30 is 120. And now k of x is almost looking like what it should be, so that I can read t off the graph. But I've got a minus 2x, and this k of x has a positive 2x. So in order to do that, well, in order to change it to a positive 2x, I've got to do a bit of reduction. And to start the reduction off, I've got to remove a common factor of negative 1 from the angle over here. So after I do that, it's going to look something like this. You've got to have square brackets because there is going to be a negative in front. And then the negative 2x changes to positive 2x. And the 120 changes to negative 120. I'll then add 360 in front here so that I can reduce it with my cost diagram. So after I add that 360, it's going to look like this. And we are now officially in the 360 minus quadrant. And in the 360 minus quadrant, cos is positive. So it's just going to morph into this. The 360 minus disappears. And then it's final answer a clock, my bro. I can just read t off the graph there. So t is the negative 120. And yes, this was like a level 17 question if I've ever seen one. And only for two marks. Yo, slag, bruh. Okay, let's have a look where those two marks come from. One mark comes from getting this cos equation. And the last mark comes from the correct answer of t. Yes, this question was just one of the nastiest ones I've seen in my time.